I've been teaching a course on Matthew's Gospel for Fuller Theological Seminary. And being rather OCD about the whole thing, I just can't let a course stand the way it is that I taught it before. Even after 20 years, I'm reading more books and doing more studies within the Gospel of Matthew. And this time around, I began to notice how Matthew uses the ideas of the heavens above and the earth below in his Gospel to teach us something rather important. Let me show you what I've been learning. Now, one of the things that Matthew is known for is using the phrase, Kingdom of Heaven. If I do a search for the phrase, Kingdom of Heaven, we get some very interesting results. Matthew is the only book in the Bible that uses that phrase. Now, that should raise your eyebrows to start with. Many interpreters think that Matthew is the most Jewish of the Gospel, which is very questionable. In fact, most scholars today think that Matthew is primarily writing to a church that is Gentile with a healthy mix of Jewish converts within it as well. But that's besides the point. Because of this older view, many think that Matthew uses the phrase Kingdom of Heaven instead of Kingdom of God so that he doesn't refer to the name of God. It's a circumlocution. But if we do a search for the phrase Kingdom of God, what we notice is that Luke uses this phrase 31 times, Mark 14 times, and Matthew four times. And Matthew is even less shy about just using the word God. He uses the word God 46 times. So Matthew is not shy about using the term kingdom of God or the name of God. So why does Matthew use kingdom of heaven? Let me give you a slightly different take on the question and see if it works or not. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 to 30 years, I've been teaching seminary in the United States and around the world. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and bring it to anyone, anywhere on YouTube. So if you find these videos useful and informative, please subscribe, give them a thumbs up, and let somebody else know about it. That's the best way you can help me out, and it costs you nothing at all. Let's do another search here. If I do a search for the word heaven in the New English translation, we can see that it is used 370 times throughout the New English translation. Let's get a bit more granular here. Now notice in the Old Testament, if we just take a look at the most number of times it's used, it's used 25 times in the book of Psalms. If we scroll down to the New Testament, we notice that in the book of Revelation, it's used 46 times. And you can understand that. Revelation is all about John's heavenly vision and journey. But this is where it gets really interesting. Matthew uses the term heaven 76 times. It's clearly a key term to be understood in Matthew, and it's by far the book that uses it more than any other in the entire Bible. So why does Matthew use the phrase kingdom of heaven? I think it's because of how he construes the world in which he lives and how he is using a vertical polarity to present his account of Jesus' life. Now let's take a tour through Matthew's Gospel and I'll show you what I mean. In this video, we're going to do a thematic study in Matthew's Gospel. Our study today is restricted to look at Matthew and his uses of these concepts in order to understand his message better. Anytime you tell a story, you need a setting, where the story takes place, and elements in that setting help you communicate the message. Matthew uses the sky or the heavens above and the earth where Jesus, the disciples, and everyone else lives as the two main aspects to the setting in which he tells us the story of Jesus' life. In order for us to have an inkling how the people in the Bible view these terms, we need to use our imagination a little bit. Imagine living when travel involved walking, maybe riding a horse or a camel if you were incredibly rich. No airline travel. You didn't have telescopes to peer into the sky or the heavens. No knowledge of space, the atmosphere above the hill or the mountaintops. So when Matthew uses the term heavens, what would his churches have understood? We need to go back to Genesis. And remember in Genesis chapter one, God separated the waters below from the waters above. The sky was like a canopy over the earth, or a dome. It contained the sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds, and other heavenly bodies. The heavens were also used to speak about the habitation of God, that God dwelt in the heavens. 
But the Old Testament is very careful to point out that God was not restricted to the heavens. And finally, we need to mention something about the phrase heavens and earth. When this phrase is used in the Bible, it is used to refer to the totality of creation. All that has been, all that is, and all that will be, everything that you can see constitutes the heavens and the earth. The earth is another important domain of creation. Human life was taken from the earth. Adam was taken from the dirt or the ground. Human life sprang from the earth. It's where human life takes place and to which we return when we die. And finally, we need to say a little bit about the phrase heaven and earth. When this phrase is used in the Bible, it's a way to speak about the totality of God's creation. All that is above us, all that is within our world, heaven and earth. Now, one of the things to notice as we go through Matthew's gospel is not just the term heaven and earth, but also associated terms. For example, if you use the term family, there's a number of words and ideas that are associated with family. Children, parents, siblings, house, upbringing, so on. These associated terms, this cluster of the main term and the associated terms is what we would call a linguistic frame. So as we go through Matthew's gospel, don't just look at the terms heaven and earth, but look at these associated terms with it as well. Now, the first story I want to look at is Matthew's account of Jesus' birth. And right at the very beginning, we have the visit from the Magi. Now, you will remember from the Charlie Brown Christmas special that the Magi followed the star to Bethlehem to follow Jesus. Stars were not just seen as lights in the firmament, but they were also seen as signs from God and were also associated with heavenly beings. Oftentimes it appears that stars are a metaphorical reference to angelic beings. Psalm 148 verse 3, Praise Him, O sun and moon. Praise Him, all ye shiny stars. Matthew highlights these heavenly connections that surround Jesus' birth. But we got to keep moving on because we only got a limited amount of time in this video. So let's move on to the baptism. Matthew, like Mark and Luke, also include numerous references to the heavens in Jesus' baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, after Jesus was baptized, as he's coming up out of the water, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my one dear Son, in him I take great delight. Jesus is physically present on earth, in fact, in the Jordan River, but knows how Jesus' baptism is attested to with heavenly references. The heavens open, the Spirit descends like a bird, and we have a voice from the heavens as well. Immediately after the baptism, we have Jesus' temptation. And in the final temptation in Matthew's Gospel, the devil takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Now this reference to mountains is important because mountains play a key role in Matthew's thought and also in ancient cosmology as well. Mountains were the highest elevations that someone could reach and as such presented a proximity to the heavens that other locations did not possess. Elijah had his encounter with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The temple in Jerusalem and other temples were built on the tops of mountains because these were the closest you could get as a human being to the heavens. The Sermon on the Mount is another example. Matthew tells us that Jesus went up on the mountain and began to teach. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The opening with the Beatitudes are also filled with numerous references to the heavens. The poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God, and so on. However, the reference I want to look at in the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, we're taught, Pray in this way, Our Father in heaven, your name be honored. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, dot, 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 dot. Now notice how this prayer creates a link between heaven and earth. It opens with petitions about God's kingdom coming, God's name being sanctified, and His will being done. All heavenly references. And then right in the middle, we have the phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. Now in my video on the Lord's Prayer, and I'll have a link over here to it, 
I mentioned how the English reverses the Greek here. The Greek has, as in heaven, so also on earth. The word order in the Greek preserves this shift from the heavenly realms in the first half of the prayer to the earthly realm in the second half. As in heaven, so also on earth. Then we get the earthly petition or reality, give us today our daily bread. The Lord's Prayer introduces one of the themes in Matthew's Gospel regarding the heavens and the earth. While the heavens are the sky are above and out of reach for humans, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' ministry and his teachings partially blend these two realms. Heaven influences the earth and the earth influences heaven. In the Lord's Prayer, we see the first half is a prayer about the heavenly realm. So our prayers here on earth influence the heavenly realm, but then it also touches the earthly realm. Give us this day our daily bread. A related concept takes place in chapter 18, verses 18 through 19. Jesus teaches us that in terms of church discipline, that whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and what you release on earth will be released in heaven. And what we agree upon on earth here, our Father who is in heaven will do for us. So we see how Jesus' ministry mediates between the two realms, heaven and earth, but also he wants us to be involved in this. But we got to keep moving forward here. No time to hang around. In chapter 8, verse 23, we have the stilling of the storm. Jesus and his disciples are caught in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, but Jesus is asleep in the boat. When they wake him up and beg him to save them, he rebukes the wind and the sea, and all was calm. But lest we miss the point, the disciples ask, what sort of person is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Winds were part of the heavenly realm. The sea was a deep, dark, dangerous place that was outside man's control, but here on the earth. But God also controlled that. What kind of person is this that controls the forces of the sky, or the heavens above, and the depths of the sea. This brings us to the transfiguration. In chapter 17, Matthew tells us that Jesus took his disciples up to the top of the mountain and he was transfigured there. Now the mountaintop is important because this is the closest that early man could get to the heavens. Remember, they don't have planes, balloons, or anything yet. So climbing a mountain is as good as you got. Now going back to the setting and how Matthew describes the situation, they're on a mountaintop. Jesus shines like the sun up there. A bright cloud overshadows them, and they hear a voice from that. All these elements are part of the heavens and part of this verticality within Matthew's Gospel. When Jesus returns from the mountaintop to the valley below, Matthew presents us with a man who pleads with Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he suffers terribly, and he has many seizures. And the word seizures there, I think, is a really bad translation. In the Greek, it's selenadzai. He is struck by the moon. On the mountaintop, Jesus shone like the sun. Down below, we meet a boy struck by the moon. And one last thing. If you live in Colorado and you're talking about mountains, well, you just have to. This is why Raphael's depiction of the Transfiguration is so powerful. He really captures the verticality going up on the mountain and then coming back down. What happens above, what happens below. And this is a central theme in Matthew's Gospel, the heavens above and the earth on which we live. I don't know if you can see it, but we got a big storm coming in from the north and I better book it home before I get soaking wet. A few moments later. I don't know if you can hear me, but I made it home just before the storm hit here. It is chucking it down. Oh, and be sure to check out my video on Raphael's depiction of the Transfiguration. I'll have it over here in case you missed it. In chapters 24 and 25, we get a section that's called the Little Apocalypse. Like the book of Revelation, apocalyptic texts employ all kinds of references to heavenly concepts to communicate their message. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus compares the permanence of his words to the temporal nature of the entirety of creation. All that you see and know will pass away, but not Jesus' words. It's very similar to his response in the Sermon on the Mount about the relationship between his teachings and the Torah. In 5.18, 
Jesus says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until everything takes place. Moving on in the apocalyptic discourse, in 24, 29 through 21, immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man arriving on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet blast and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew recounted Jesus' birth with heavenly references. Now he tells us about Jesus' return and he paints a picture of the heavens being shaken to the core when Jesus returns. During his trial before the Sanhedrin, they are frustrated because they can't find a reliable witness against him. So the high priest uses his authority to question Jesus directly. I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus then responds to him, You have said it yourself, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Matthew uses these very tangible physical concepts, earth where we live, heaven above, and also where God dwells. And he uses these tangible concepts to present his theological message about who Jesus is. At the very conclusion of Matthew's gospel, we have the Great Commission. And once again, I've got a video on that. I'll have a link to it up over here if you're interested. I'll also have links to all these videos underneath this video in the show more or the description section. Jesus meets his disciples on a mountaintop in Galilee. This is a liminal space once again between heaven and earth that I've been talking about. And he then commands them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, throughout Matthew's Gospel, he takes great pains to portray Jesus' birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection in terms of both heaven above and earth here. By use of this vertical polarity between the heavens and the earth, Matthew teaches a great deal theologically and Christologically. Jesus comes from the heavenly realms, and his ministry and life and death are attested to by the heavenly realities themselves. He not only has authority and power over the heavenly realm, but also here on earth. Who is this then that even the wind and the seas obey him? And finally, he mediates between these two realms, the heavenly and the earthly, and he has commissioned his church to be involved in this. We are to do this through prayer, the Lord's Prayer. We do this through church discipline, and we do this also through the Great Commission, going and making disciples of all nations. Be sure to stay tuned for the next video, and until then, I will leave you with the word of peace.